There's nothing like wrangling up the kids, loading up the car, and heading to the beach for a day of surf and sunshine. It's a place to throw caution to the wind, to unwind and relax. And of course, the perfect place to get a great tan. But for most of human history, people thought going to the beach was less like being in a Beach Boys music video and more like a scene in the rated R version of Pirates of the Caribbean. There was the humanity canceling flood in Genesis. There was also the Kraken, which terrorized sailors off the coast of Norway and Sweden. And let's not forget all those issues Odysseus had getting back home after the Trojan War. And then there are the very real threats of storms, pirates, shipwrecks, and colonizers. William Shakespeare summed up the sentiment of the time in Shakespeare in Love. My story starts at sea, a perilous voyage to an unknown land, a shipwreck. The wild waters roar and heave. The brave vessel is dashed all to pieces and all the helpless souls within her drowned. So how did we reposition going to the beach from a dangerous proposition to the perfect spot to relax? The answer, it might surprise you. We've established the coast was considered dangerous. It was where natural disasters occurred and where bandits came ashore. So for the most part, people stayed away. It took until the 18th century for the tide of public opinion to turn. Great Britain's 18th century industrial revolution was in a way the springboard of going to the beach. It gave rise to inventions like the spinning jenny, water frame, and the steam engine locomotive. It also gave rise to, well, big cities themselves. Prior to this period, most Europeans lived and worked on small farms in rural areas. But the new factories that powered the Industrial Revolution needed workers. However, these cities didn't have adequate infrastructure to handle the massive uptick of residents. So they began to get pretty grimy. British aristocrats and intellectuals, put off by this influx of working class laborers, became preoccupied with health and hygiene. So two theories rose to prominence that suggested the beach could be the cure. The first idea was fathered by Robert Burton, an English scholar who wrote the 1621 tome, The Anatomy of Melancholy. Melancholy is a deep sadness or persistent depression that was a widespread concern in the Elizabethan era, especially for the educated class. Burton himself called it an epidemic at the time of his writings. Burton believed the best remedy for melancholy was a change in one's environment. He recommended traveling, a varied landscape, and an overlook of the horizon. So those are the means began getting outside of their home city's borders. The second theory hypothesized that a dip into chilly waters could rejuvenate the body. Folks adopted this treatment for all sorts of issues. Melancholy, leprosy, gout, menstrual problems, hysteria, and more. This pairing outdoorsiness and a dip in chilly water for health gave birth to the idea of going to the beach. But it still was not necessarily a leisure activity. That transition did not occur until the beach's business potential was realized. The first seaside resort opened in the small town of Scarborough, near York. Others soon followed to accommodate the rising number of sea bathers. Elites flocked to them. Even King George IV visited a seaside resort in Brighton to help his gout. In their early days, these resorts and seashores were exclusively for the elite. They were the only residents with the resources to reach them. But by 1830, Robert Stevenson's Invicta train line ran its first regular service from Canterbury to the seaside town of Whitstable, six miles away. By the 1840s, the beach, a once feared place, had been reimagined as a restorative escape from the city. Across the pond in New York, the first seaside towns were built in the late 1820s. Resorts popped up in Rockaway, Brighton Beach, and Manhattan Beach. Like the resorts in the UK, these resorts attracted wealthy New Yorkers at first. 
In an effort to make these beaches more accessible to New Yorkers, five train lines were built to connect Coney Island to the rest of New York. Coney Island, the world's greatest fun frolic, with its beach miles long, all peppered with people. The place where merriment is king. Visitors flocked in droves not only for the beach, but also for the gambling, the dancing, horse racing, and boxing matches. Soon boardwalks were all the rage. Then beach sports like volleyball and surfing brought a laid back crowd to the shores. By the 20th century, the benefits of sunlight exposure were recognized. The sun's rays boosted vitamin D and was now a proven remedy for diseases like rickets, a disease of children caused by vitamin D deficiency. Let's join the Tannibals. Make the most of moments in the sun. Copper tone makes living in the sunshine fun. As the century progressed, the West's beauty standards began to change. Now a sun-kissed glow with a sought-after look. All of these things snowballed together to make beach going a cultural phenomenon. The weekend escape that we all know and love today. So did these Victorian era beachgoers get it right? Should we be going to the beach? Depends on who you ask. They might have been onto something as to the benefits of cold water. Chilly water has since been proven to boost white blood cell count, in turn improving immune system response. Cold water has also been proven to decrease stress and enhance circulation in the body. But still, unforeseen problems have come to light. Of course, beaches and shorelines are still littered with real threats, including rip currents, sharks, and the risk of sunburn. Add to that the increased risk of skin cancers if you're not properly protecting yourself from those harmful UV rays. And then there's the damage we do to these shorelines. Since humans have started hitting the shores with regularity, there's been an increase in pollution. Everything beachgoers use can end up buried in sand or swept out to sea, further contributing to the problem of marine trash. Now you know, going to the beach wasn't always as cool as David Hasselhoff made it look. So the next time you go to the beach, maybe try to see it through the eyes of a pre-18th century farmer. It might make you second guess why we go at all. What are your thoughts on going to the beach? Do you love or hate it? Let us know in the comments. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell in the corner so you'll be notified when we publish new videos. Thanks for watching.